Okay, looks like we have people starting to join. We're going to start our webinar probably about 30 or 40 seconds after 1 p.m. Pacific, just to give everybody a chance to get in. So just stand by for about 30, 40 seconds and we'll go. Okay, for the people I can see joining, just another 20 seconds and we'll get the show on the road here. Okay, it's about one after, so let's get started. Thanks everybody for joining. My name is Michael Egerling with Trustero. On the phone with me, I have Nick Martin, who is my colleague here at Trustero. And we also have a special guest today that we're really excited to talk to, uh, George Totep. George um, is an industry veteran. And he's going he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about AI and compliance and how we can solve some of the biggest problems that we're facing in GRC today. So before we go, let me talk a little bit about who George is. So George has been in the security field for more than 20 years. He established and managed a security and GRC functions in large companies like the World Bank, Goldman Sachs, Visa, Symantec, Atlassian, and most recently, Snowflake. So quite a few names in there that we've all heard of. He has a master's degree in computer science and business, business administration, and he is a member of several advisory boards um, and on the board of the Bay Area CISO Council. So we are we have, we have a killer guest for our first for our very first um, InfoSec leaders um, session here today. We've been doing some webinars at Trustero for some time now, but um, we're introducing this um, this new series where we talk to InfoSec leaders. And George, we're, we're feeling very lucky to have you on the line today. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michael. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be part of this series and I look forward to speaking with you. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, a couple things before we get going. So we have a bunch of people on the line. Uh, pretty good numbers showed up to talk to you, George, and to ask some questions. Anybody who is on the webinar today, uh, you can use the QA tool on Zoom to ask questions. We have several uh, Trustero people on the line to uh, to answer questions if they can. But if the questions are going to be, you know, I'm guessing a bunch of them are going to be specific to George. So go ahead and ask those questions using the tool. We'll make sure those get to George. We'll answer as many as we can live. Um, and then if we don't, we'll make sure that we get we get a chance to answer those in the follow-up email. So we'll talk to George, we'll get some answers out in the follow-up email as well. So please answer those questions. Please ask your questions here. That always adds a lot to these to these webinars. We also have Nick Martin, who is our VP of product at Trustero here. And Nick's my color commentator today to add some add some of the AI, you know, know-how and, and intelligence on some of these topics that, that George is talking about. So with that, let's let's get it started. Um, so George, why don't you just tell us a little bit about give us some background on your GRC career and, and kind of what you're what you're up to now. Like what is what does this kind of evolution look like for you over the last 20 years? So I started my career in information security. I've been doing security architecture, architecture reviews, those kind of things. And then uh, started uh, leading teams, uh, functions, and then slowly shifted towards GRC. Somehow the whole idea of risk management excited me uh, because it was getting close to the business. It's kind of on the, the border between business and technology. Um, and uh, I, I really moved into the risk management GRC space when I when I started at Visa about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, then I went to Atlassian where I established the, the risk management and GRC function. And now the last place that I am in is uh, 
Snowflake. Um, as you probably know, Snowflake is a large data company, data in the cloud, analytics, those kind of things. So some really interesting challenges to, uh, to, to solve there. Um, I'm responsible for the customer trust. So you can think about the whole life cycle of trust. So getting business objectives, staying really close with our sales, business development folks, uh, getting the business objectives, speaking with the customer, how those things are affecting the customer, uh, speaking with the regulators, understand where the regulations are going, then deliver the actual product, all different kind of certifications and assurances, and uh, at the end of the life cycle, supporting the, the customer. So any kind of questions they have, any kind of uh, customer audits, uh, clarifications, how to use the tool in the compliance matter, all of those things. So that's kind of the scope of my responsibility there. Um, as you can imagine, we're using a lot of tools. Um, the, the time of a single GRC tool is gone. Now uh, it's kind of the best of, best of brands. Uh, we have a whole number of that, a whole number of uh, GRC tools doing different parts of the GRC organization. And of course, we have a whole bunch of home developed tools uh, leveraging, heavily re leveraging the capabilities. Of, uh... So, why don't we move on to our second question here? Can you tell us? Um, so it was a great that was a great introduction to what you've been up to. What do you think has changed the most uh, in your time working in the GRC field? And then specifically, and I'll remind you if we kind of get off track, I want to know what do you think has changed the most in the last two years? Yeah. So it's kind of interesting when I started my career. The name of the game was globalization overall, not just for security and GRC, but in general. Uh, we were kind of expanding all over the world. There's, those are multinational companies, uh, a lot of interesting markets. It, it was a very interesting time. Uh, what I'm noticing in the last, last probably four or five years is something like of an opposite trend, um, for lack of a better word, deglobalization, uh, where we, we start seeing a lot of um, uh, regional, uh, regional requirements and uh, uh, regional regulations that are very specific. Uh, for example, we are all familiar with with DORA. Um, that kind of spurred the whole idea by, about privacy that went everywhere around the globe, and now pretty much every country and every every region has something to say about privacy, and usually they, they are slightly different from one another. Um, another example that, again, is coming from EU is DORA. Um, that's the regulation uh, around the critical infrastructure. Uh, and again, we're seeing similar things happening everywhere. So there is a lot of kind of a focus happening on data process and business residency. So how do you how do you uh, reside the data only in a particular region or a particular country? Uh, what about processing of that data? Should it happen only in that that country? Um, and in some cases, it goes to extreme. We're talking about sovereignty, where you even have to establish your business presence over there. You have to have an officer of the company over there and all, all of that stuff. So those intricacies for uh, different regions and, and countries are becoming more and more. And of course, that is impacting us heavily, um, which means that you have to know your ecosystem. So in general, uh, we have to be much more careful about who our suppliers are. How do we do security assessment of those suppliers? How do we make sure that uh, they maintain operations? And that's kind of the beginning of it, uh, but there are more and more questions from a global perspective start coming in around our suppliers, like who they are, what kind of business they are in, uh, who are their suppliers, like extending the supply chain further down. Um, the same thing about your customers. Now, uh, there is this uh, notion of know your customer in the financial world, uh, but that is expanding to pretty much everybody else. There are some regulations that recently came here in the U.S., even uh, that require to at least know who your customer is, where they're located, what kind of business they have. Um, and that is kind of expanding to the entire ecosystem around you. So your supplier, your customer, but also your business partner. So this is becoming kind of increased awareness of who you're dealing with. Um, and on top of that, uh, there is an increased tension uh, in the global uh, geopolitical uh, space. Um, which means that the threat from those actors are becoming more and more real. We just heard about Microsoft being targeted. Uh, there are some other large names that came towards the end of last year. 
So this is becoming more and more prevalent, and uh, that kind of is the result of what I would call this deglobalization. And this may seem a little bit more focused on larger international companies, but in, in fact, it affects everyone. Um, so most likely, uh, especially if you're a software company, you have some kind of an outsourced development somewhere in Eastern Europe or India or somewhere. And uh, those regulations will, will start in, uh, affecting you or the geopolitical events will, will, will start affecting you. Uh, the other thing is that uh, probably at some point you're a supplier to a larger multinational company. Maybe your, your business is set up here in the US, you're some kind of a relatively small two, 300 people company in the software space, but you're supplying and you want to supply to larger multinational uh, companies which means that a lot of those regulations and requirements are going to start flowing through to you. Uh, one example I would, I would give is the recent SBOM, the Software Bill of Materials. So pretty much everybody who is working with the federal government has to have a Software Bill of Materials. And if you're supplying a federal government supplier, then you're somewhere there and you have to answer some questions and probably some uh, are going, going to come uh, to you. Um, and there is this kind of a, in a weird way, globalization of, of the requirements, of the, of the regulation. Um, I, I still remember when our privacy officer, when GDPR came into effect, our privacy officer said, congratulations, we are all regulated companies now. Uh, because there is no way to avoid it. it, it, it Europe is, is a big market. Everybody at some point is doing business with some European companies. Um, same, same thing with China. I mean, China has a lot of regulations as well. So at some point, somehow, you, Maybe not directly, but indirectly, you're involved in those things. Same thing with India. So in, inevitably, you're going to be uh, affected by, by those regulations, if not directly, indirectly. And um, if you look at kind of what happened in the past, I don't know, five, six years, talk to was a big deal. Only only a few companies, only larger companies, were focusing on staying in talk to. Nowadays, talk to is kind of a is is a table stake. Everybody needs to have it, and um, we can talk about it later, how that affects your operations, how you have to become more efficient, how you have to use more tooling in order to get those things going. Because not everybody can afford to have a 5, 6, 10, 15 people uh, GRC team to work on SOC 2 or ISO 27000 or HIPAA or whatever, whatever else it is. So we have yeah. to go for efficient. Um, so, it's, an, it's an interesting point with SOC 2, George, how it's yeah. and, and how you know, deglobalization and the pro and the proliferation of SOC two has made it so that even the smallest companies need to start thinking about this. But it's still really, really hard to do. Do you have any advice for some of these companies and how to how to take this on, even if they're if they don't necessarily have teams to to, to get after it? Yeah. So uh, the good news here is that whenever there is a demand, there is a supply. So a lot of companies started working on that and. Um, usually they're addressing those more prevalent requirements like SOC2, ISO 27000, HIPAA, um, they're, they're coming along. So um, if you're a relatively small company, uh, probably you should look at those, those suppliers. And not only from a technology perspective, uh, we kind of get used to the default of technology, but also they are a wealth knowledge of information. They can give you the technology, but they also give you a lot of advice on what is coming down the pike, how do you structure certain things. So but try to use your suppliers, not as just technology supplier, but as a knowledge supplier as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I was uh, I was just gonna say, you know, uh, given this environment, what are some steps that people can take? And it sounds, you know, really like basically be prepared it's coming from for you whether you know you want it to or not and maybe it's already arrived and then yeah. uh definitely pursue information security you know compliance frameworks that's going to provide kind of foundation to prepare you for then whichever jurisdictions you're going to be in and then it's it's kind of building on top of that infosec foundation that uh is going to set you up for success. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good point because there's so many frameworks for pretty much everything. Um, and we can easily get lost in, in two, three, four, five letter of abbreviations. Uh, the good thing is that there's some kind of a fundamental capabilities 
that cut across pretty much everything. So if you pick those few frameworks that are really relevant to you, that customers are asking for, um, and you develop those capabilities using those frameworks, you're going to be in a really good spot. So things like data process operation isolation, that, that's kind of a key. Um, how do you how do you separate the data in the US from the data in Europe, from the data in India, from the data in China? And the level of separation, because there are a lot of nuances here. Uh, same thing with the processing. There are a lot of com uh, countries that start requiring not only data, but also process uh, localization. Um, and the operations, like for example, if you if you work with France, the data should be France, the processing should be in France, your support organization should be in France, you should have a business presence in France, and you should have an officer in France. Right? So like pretty much everything. Now, maybe France is not a relevant market to you, but your customer work operates in France. And again, that requirement may, may slow down to you. Uh, the other thing is how quickly you can disconnect, how quickly you can ditch this thing. Um, because if something happens, you should be able to, but generally you have to monitor the communications with those different locations. But if something happens, if there is a penetration or something, you should be able to quickly switch off this thing. And um, maybe if that's a supplier of yours, you should have kind of a list of suppliers on the back of your mind that you can switch to. Um, then, so the question is how 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 self sufficient that 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 location that you establish is there, and it needs to be. Um, and from a business resilience, I would say tabletop exercises. Uh, maybe I have a bias towards agility, but having those tabletop exercises are extremely important. Just get the stake, stakeholders around the table, come up with a scenario. If, let's say, we have a breach, what will happen? And then you're going to discover that a lot of you're not prepared for a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of, in a lot of cases, oh, we need to notify the customers, but some customers may, may need to notify in a different way. Oh, what are we going to say to our employees? What are we going to take to sell to the press? Oh, maybe the regulator is going to come in. So what do we do with that? Oh, at the same time, we have to supply uh, information to the customers that are involved. How do we integrate our internet management with their internet management? So sitting around the table and just going through the scenario is going to open your eyes for so many things. Um, so the other thing that I, I would say is that speed and efficiency are a key. But those regulations and those changes in the business environment are happening so quickly uh, that when when you build something, you have to build with the mind of, okay, like 10 or 100 times the capacity that, that you need at the moment, because you won't have time to come back and, and rebuild it again. And the efficiency that you can gain, we were talking about the technology. Um, you have to be careful about what this technology gets, but you need that technology. And the word AI comes to mind, and probably we're gonna talk about AI at some point, because those conversations always lead to AI. Uh, but AI is one of the key technologies that can help you increase the efficiency of your team. Uh, and sh you should definitely look in, into that. Can you, can you kind of, can you, can we dig into that? I mean, it's in the title of this talk, so we should dig into a little bit more. Um, what's been your experience so far with, with AI? Has it impacted, has it really impacted your job yet? Or is it kind of sitting out there in the periphery and then, um, you know, what do you think? What do you think we need to be thinking about in GRC as as AI gets gets bigger and just is everywhere now? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because AI has been around for a while, uh, but probably in the last, I would say, ten years, we have the necessary technology to actually starting advancing on the AI. The theoretical models have been around for for a long time, uh, and probably in the last couple of years, there is a general awareness around the AI since uh, since GPT. Um, so it's kind of interesting how we're thinking of AI in, in two probably opposite ways. There is this set of, uh, there's this thinking that, oh, this is really scary, it's gonna kill us all, and we uh, should be really careful about that. And then there is the opposite thinking of, oh, this is amazing, this is the best thing that ever happened to humanity, we should, we should embrace it right away. Um, yeah. I think the, the, the the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, so why is it scary? Um, so on one hand, if you think about how your company uses AI, a lot of the existing approaches will work. Uh, so think about SDLC. Uh, whether you're doing algorithmic or 
ML type of development, um, you have to look at the code. Uh, you have to do some kind of a, a vulnerability scanning. You have to do security. All, all of those things are still valid. We should still do those things. But on top of that, there are other things that are specific around the, around the AI. For example, how do you address the problem with uh, the integrity of the data? So how do you know that this thing is not hallucinating? I mean, what, what are the methodologies that you're going to use to make sure that the answers you're getting from it are actually legitimate, right? Um, there are things around the supply chain. Um, now, models started growing up, and, and uh, there, there are various standards for exchanging models. So I wouldn't be surprised if your development team is either using somebody else's ML on top of their infrastructure, or they're just buying the model, or, or even open source models are out there. So get the model with all the weights and everything, and you run it on your infrastructure with your own data. That is also possible. So all of those rules that we had and we currently have for the supply chain, they, they still apply. The intellectual property concerns and all those kind of things. Support is, is another one. Uh, on top of that, the regulations, what, why, why it makes it a little bit scary is that the regulations are not there yet. So there is no uh, consistent framework of how we should think about AI in general. Um, we know that NIST 853 came up with a, uh, with a refresh, AI uh, targeted refresh. Um, there are a lot of industry groups that are thinking about, okay, what are the frameworks we can develop for the AI or how we can extend the existing framework to think about the AI. At the same time, the regulators are coming heavy. Um, probably you heard about um, open AI that was banned for about a month last year last year in Italy because they were using privacy data in a way that the Italian regulator didn't really like. So <clears throat> more and more of that we're going to see. EU, for example, is thinking about uh, the metadata. Uh, we talked about the data residency and the focus of the data residency is whether the actual data uh, resides in the region. Um, and the metadata hasn't been in focus so much late, uh, before. But lately, uh, there are some questions about, OK, with such powerful AI mo ML models, can we use the metadata to reconstruct the original data? Or if you're querying the data, those prompts that you're having, are they part of the real data or their metadata? Are there going to be some regulations around that? Of course, all of that is going to affect the companies that are doing business in that region or, or, or their supplier. So um, it's scary, the bottom line. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it's really awesome. Um, because it gives you that efficiency uh, that I was talking about. Um, for example, I have a friend uh, who is in marketing, and he said that instead of 10 days writing a marketing paper, it took him only two hours. And the question was really how to adjust the prompts for the AI. And once it got it into the group, it was just quick iterations, and he got exactly what, what he needed. Um, so if you if you if you look at your own GRC operation, uh, the question is: Are there any mundane, repeatable works that are happening with your within your function that you can replace with ML? Probably not 100 percent, but as much as you can. Um, so, for example, questionnaires. Everybody is dealing with questionnaires. So if you get a tool, and I'm doing a shameless plug over here for Tresero, but if you get okay. a tool that can give you not 100 percent let's say 60 percent effectiveness i mean accuracy in 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 filling in the questionnaire and you have six people doing questionnaires day in day out that means three of them can do something else something that is more interesting more impactful more return on investment than just answering questionnaire um so questionnaires is one example audit readiness is another example that's a mundane work like 90 percent of audit readiness is a mundane work so probably you can use AI to, to improve this thing, to do some kind of a scan before the auditors come in. And I can tell you that auditors are actually looking at AI as well for the low level kind of a mundane work to be replaced by, by the AI. Um, another example would be security assessment. If you think about it, 80% of the security assessment is just obtaining the data and putting it all together. ML can do that for you. So think about um, AI as an assistant uh, it will not replace your, your people, but it will help them be more efficient. And as we talked before about all these regulations that are constantly coming in in the changing environment, you have to become efficient. As a side effect, you also understand AI better. So when your company starts using AI, and probably they already are, 
if when they start using AI, you have a better understanding of, okay, what are the use cases? What are the scenarios? What I should be careful about? Because I'm also a user. Of, of, of. You know, I'm curious as, you know, as, as a, as a leader in the space and as a manager for many years, do you, do you have kind of that idea of when, when my team doesn't have to answer security questionnaires, when my team doesn't have to do, doesn't have to, to do audit scanning and things like, like pre-audit scanning, do you know the things, the big, the more strategic work already? Or is that something that you think managers have to go and figure out? Like, I'm going to have this time sometime in the next few years. What would I have my team start to tackle? No, you plan for that, right? You, you normally plan for it. You have your operations, you know, you allocate your resources and you plan for this. But believe me, if I can spare six people from, let's say, three people out of six, uh, to instead of doing quick security questionnaire, I would much rather deploy those people to look at, okay, what is new thing that is coming? Let me establish my, my better relationship with my customers to understand how that impacts them so I can be more effective in helping those customers. I think that has a much better return on investment than just filling in a questionnaire over and over. And we all know those questionnaires, they're asking about the same thing, but in a different way. Yeah. I, I also, uh, you know, know from, from talking to uh, various folks like you, George, that, um, you know, the demands on your GRC staff are, are often, you know, far exceed the available capacity you have anyway. And so there's pretty uh, important kind of triaging exercise that happens where you need to, you know, you you give say like if we're thinking about third party risk, you're only really giving the the highest risk tier uh, right. the most scrutiny, and and perhaps if you had more capacity, that would actually allow you to potentially do you know do more more work. Uh, where, you know, uh, at some points today, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, there are some negative consequences because you weren't able to do as much as maybe you you would otherwise like to. Yeah. So we were talking about kind of the, the regulations from the global perspective. Think about them is that the requirements are such that it's really hard to turn on a dime in six months and get it. Even if you used to, it's really hard. So... It is better to, again, deploy those people to look at those regulations, think strategically and say, hey, two years down the road, we're going to face this thing. Let's start working on it right now and let somebody else or something else take care of the mundane questionnaires, audit readiness, security assessments, all, all, all of those things. Um, it, it's kind of a, there is a philosophical component over here because traditionally security and GRC have been seen as a, um, more of an insurance uh, component uh, of the business. Um, so they're there just to, to get us all in, in the same level with everybody else and to prevent something bad from happening. And you know how insurance is. Nobody's going down the street screaming, yeah, this insurance and it's awesome, right? Everybody's trying to save on insurance. Uh, so that, that, that affects the traditional thinking of, of security. You're trying to do as much as possible with as little resources as possible. Whereas if you focus on thinking about security and GRC as a value add for a business, as a differentiator, um, kind of stay close with yourself folks, with the business development, stay close with the engineering and, and the product people, um, then you can make security and, and GRC even uh, as, a, as a differentiator. And again, relieving those resources from the mundane operational work related to insurance into more of a value add for the company that those are good for you as a, as, a, as a leader in the gym yeah like you, you'd be able to unlock more sales because yeah. of how incredible your security is exactly 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 well believe it or not we have about one minute left so i want to do one quick thing and then we're going to try to answer one or two questions so you were talking a little bit about questionnaires. Just so happens, we knew this was going to happen. But we uh, trust Arrow's questionnaire copilot uh, that Nick and the team have worked on for quite a long time now, and is just a really powerful tool for quickly answering security questionnaires using AI. Is going live today, uh, and it's free. And so, a couple links on the screen there. So our 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 new tool. We have a free version, advanced version. The free version is available to anybody on this call and really anybody on the world, and you can have it up and running in the next, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 seconds, Nick. So that's on the screen. I'll leave that on the screen when we ask George, uh, try to get to two questions here, and then we'll see what we can answer in the in the follow-up that goes out. 
So George, here's one. Um, let's see. What's your advice to other GRC practitioners for keeping up and growing their career in the AI age and staying current? Um, so I kind of polluted a little bit about that. Uh, Specifically, think about how you can turn your space more to be a value add rather than insurance. So build the brand, stay close to, um, to, to the sales folks, stay close to the product people. Um, stay current, uh, participate in the industry group. Um, uh, kind of getting, to, getting closer to your brethren, but also see what the regulators are thinking, thinking about. Uh, see what is coming down the pipe. And in some cases, even help the regulators because regulators are looking for people like us to help them understand the field. So it's good to participate. Um, and probably a little bit maybe controversial, uh, stay, close with, stay close to your vendor uh, because it's not just the technology or the service that you're getting from them. You're getting a lot of knowledge. Uh, it's not just your vendor. They're a vendor of a lot of other companies in the same field. They've seen a lot. So you can have these frank conversations with them of like, hey, how everybody else is thinking about that? What are they doing here? Um, they can hook you up with, again, uh, contacts within, within, your, within your industry. So think about the vendors as more than just vendors. They're your, they're your partners. That's great. Okay, we're a minute over, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time. You gonna uh, anybody on the webinar and anybody who registers is gonna get a, an email from us later today. Uh, we'll include George's LinkedIn if he if he tells us that's okay. Uh, that way, if anybody has questions directly for George, they can they can bug him on LinkedIn. Um, George, again, just thank you, thank you for doing this with us. It was a great kickoff to this series could not have had a better guest on and i think we probably have a lot more to talk about so maybe we can do this again in a few months thank you thank you so much and i look forward to see the other series all right perfect um okay thanks again everybody and uh look for a follow-up email from trustero with with a little bit more information thanks nick thanks george thank talk you, to you all soon. Bye. yeah that's great bye